Welcome back to the second lecture today on uh, the end times PC213. Um, we'll start off with some questions. Um, I see uh, two questions uh, that are related from Beth, which the question basically is, uh, you know, if Satan has only a third of the angels why, and he's not omniscient, then why does he seem to have great influence on people? It looks like the devil's winning. And uh, if he's uh, defeated, you know, and why is he the prince of the world? And um, second, connected to that is, does it have to do with something uh, inherent to our nature? Yeah, so here are some of the things that I could think about. Uh, one is the Bible says, John chapter 3, that men loved darkness rather than light. So um, this is just our human, uh, as humans, our default position, uh, because sin has come into the world and sin has passed on every human person. And um, so it's our default position to prefer darkness than light. And, uh, and then because we are, sin has passed upon everyone. And uh, Satan is referred to as the God of this world uh, simply because the rulership of this world was transferred from Adam to him when Adam sinned. But Jesus regained it back for the people who would follow him. So you have Adam's race, are people who are in subjection to Satan because Adam transferred that to Satan. And then you have the second Adam, uh, or the second man, or the last Adam, that's Jesus Christ. People of his race have authority and dominion over Satan. So Satan continues to be the God of this world with respect to Adam's race, the people as in darkness, but people of the second man, the last Adam, that's Jesus, they rule and reign in life through Christ, exercising dominion. So, uh, um, so I, that's how I would look at it, you know, men love darkness rather than light, that's why the tendency is to walk in darkness. But then when we turn to Christ and are brought out of that, then we also have supremacy or mastery over Satan and can live in that place of dominion over Satan. I hope that gives some understanding. It may not necessarily, I don't know if it answers your questions, but I uh, hope that helps. Okay, I see Sri Kumar. You have a question, Sri Kumar? Yes, Pastor. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Pastor. Pastor, I want to know um, in the book of Revelation, as we were discussing chapter 14 and the 14th word and the and the book of Matthew chapter, um, the Matthew, where Matthew 13, where Jesus uh, is speaking about the um, that harvest of the end age and how the angels come and and, you know, and put the sickle. So is it uh, Jesus is these these two scripture is connected? I just want to know can we can we uh, connect with these two, two scriptures? Is it right way of interpreting? I just want to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thank so you. uh, you're saying if uh, it is Revelation fourteen fourteen, uh, you know, is that a fulfillment of uh, uh, Revelation twenty four? Um, yes, Pastor. okay, Matthew, yeah, Matthew. Oh, sorry, Matthew 24, yeah. So uh, the announcement uh, about throw, putting your sickle for the harvest has come, um, uh, I, I see a dual fulfillment. Uh, one is uh, in chapter 15, which we will get into, um, there is, you know, you see great multitudes standing before the throne of God. Uh, who are worshiping God. So this Revelation 15, if you just start reading it, uh, it, it says, you know, on a sea of glass, there is, there's this huge, huge number of people uh, who have refused 
the mark of the beast, right? And they are standing before the throne of God with harps in their hand, and they are worshiping God. And so that's an immediate fulfillment of that announcement that there's there's the harvest of souls. That means these are people who have been, of course, they've been martyred, they've been killed in the tribulation because they refused the mark of the beast, they refused to worship the beast. And you find them right there in Revelation 15. Um, uh, they are standing and worshiping God. So that's a great harvest of souls. The same language is also used at the very end, uh, in uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the tribulation, when uh, people will be uh, gathered together uh, uh, when Christ sets up His kingdom here on earth. So the same language is used there. So. Um, my response would be Revelation 14, 14 has both a dual fulfillment. One is immediately in Revelation 15, and the other one is Matthew 24, compared to Matthew 24, which is at the end of the um, tribulation, when Christ comes, uh, you know, and um, it, it, the, it, it culminates with the battle of Armageddon, the saints come, and then those who have refused um, the mark of the beast, and who are still alive will be gathered together into his kingdom. So it's a dual fulfillment. So when it, when we read the Matthew chapter 13 also, Jesus speaks about um, um, the how the angels in the 13, 49 to 50. So it will be the end of the age, the angel will come forth and take out the wicked, wicked from among the righteous and throw them into the furnace of the fire. Too. Is it the same thing what we are discussing here in the Revelation 40? Um, Matthew 13. Mm -mm -mm. Matthew 13, 49 to 50. No, just, let me just uh, check. Now, how does this thing end here? Um, Okay. Um is that the end? Um is Revelation that sorry, Matthew thirteen. The wheat and the tares, remove the tares, put them into everlasting fire. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm, I was just trying to compare the sequence of events. So uh, my answer would be yes, that it's descriptive of what happens in Revelation 19 at the Battle of Armageddon. And uh, basically, the judgment will be on all the wicked who have, uh, you know, who are just who are, who are going who are going along with the Antichrist and have come against the people of God. So they will all be destroyed. So there is that destruction uh, in the Battle of Armageddon. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks a lot. Okay. okay. Thank Sorry, just took a little bit of time. But I just wanted to match the the descriptions. Okay. Um, so. Um, yeah, Ben's question is, so God created humans who would love darkness more than light. So um, it's not that uh, God, so if you look at scripture, uh, what do we see when God creates a person, when a person is created? He is created uh, like, you know, we are learning in the other course on the human spirit. Um, people are created innocent. And so nobody's created with, and you know God doesn't create them to sin, right? We we saw that they they created innocent, and in fact they created with the conscience, which is the law of God built into every person. So that's how God created how each person is born. They created with a conscience, 
they created with eternity in the hearts. The book of Ecclesiastes says that means there's something within every person that gives them a sense of eternity, that there is more than this life. So they created like that. But when we reach the point of knowing right and wrong, because of the world we are living in, and because Adam is already, you know, the human race is already subject to sin. Sin has passed on everyone. The propensity is towards darkness. It's towards sin. So nobody needs to, you know, teach a child to lie. Uh, nobody needs to teach a child how to, you know, get angry or do something wrong. It's almost like um, the world in which we live and the sin that is there brings out that propensity to do those things. So God, but we are, but the child is innocent with the conscience. But then we, we our tendency is to go towards darkness, and so there is that struggle, and maybe you know many go into darkness and then encounter the light of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's not like God create, is creating us to sin. We were created um, we are created in the image of God. And the tendency towards sin, yes, is because of Adam's one man's disobedience, right? So Romans 5 kind of explains it. It says, through one man's disobedience, sin came into this world and all sinned. So that's Adam. Then it also says, through one man's obedience, that is through Christ, grace came upon all people and the gift of righteousness. So when we make that change into Christ, then we are empowered to walk you know, in righteousness and reign in life. Whereas in Adam, we are subject to sin and death and Satan. So really we're talking about the consequence of the fall that's extended to every human person. Okay. All right. So we are moving forward now uh, in verse chapter 15, right? So what do we see in chapter 15? Uh, while all of these things, so the four angels, have, uh, sorry, five angels have made their announcements of things that are about to happen. Uh, the first angel has, has warned people, uh, has been proclaiming the gospel. Second angel is announcing Babylon has fallen. The third angel is telling people, don't receive, don't worship the image, don't receive the mark. The fourth angel is announcing there's going to be a great harvest of souls. God put you in a sickle. The fifth angel is saying, the wine press of God is going to be crushed. It's getting ready and blood is going to flow like this. Then Revelation 15, the beginning part of Revelation 15 is we see this huge multitude of people who've come out of the tribulation. That means uh, these people, it says, you know, verse 2, 15, Revelation 15, 2, they have victory over the beast. That means uh, the beast killed them, but they have victory over the beast because they refused to receive the mark of the beast or worship the image of the beast. They refused. And they are standing before God worshiping him. Right? So, Again, we are saying it's most likely that these people um, have, uh, 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 you know, been martyred in the tribulation. We are seeing their spirits worshiping God, right? Because it does not say the same thing as it said for the 144,000 Jews. For the 144,000 Jews, it says they were redeemed out of the earth as first fruits. It doesn't use that language for these people whom we are seeing before the throne of God worshiping. So these people in Revelation 15 are likely as those who have been martyred and their spirits, their souls are worshiping God. Then the next thing we see in Revelation 15 is the seven angels get ready to pour out seven bowls of judgment. So this is the last, this is the final bowl. Revelation 15, seven. The seven bowls of wrath. So we had seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, right? So basically Revelation 16 is just telling us one after the other what happens as each bowl is poured out on the earth. Meaning that, uh, you know, 
you know, don't imagine there's some bowl being tilted in heaven and something being poured out on the earth. It's just saying, you know, it's like, okay, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen, right? There's the sequence of judgments happening. So uh, when there is the, the, the first of the seven bowl judgments, Revelation 16, 2, now there are sores that come upon all the people, sores, so like a skin problem, skin disease. It comes on people who are worshiping the mark of the beast. The second bowl uh, is that the sea and the waters in the sea are becoming like uh, uh, blood of, of dead men. So the waters on the earth are affected, polluted, uh, and it's a terrible situation. Third, uh, Revelation 14, if you're 16, verse 4, the third bowl, now the rivers and the springs become blood. So not only are the seas affected, the rivers and the springs, the waters are affected. So obviously um, uh, it's, it's going to affect, you know, all the drinking water systems uh, over the world. Uh, Revelation 16, 8, uh, the fourth bowl, the sun um, uh, scorches men with fire. So there's going to be intense heat uh, on the earth. The sun scorches men with fire. And people are going to blaspheme the name of God. And it says they did not repent. So even though all these things are happening, people are not turning to God. Fifth bowl, uh, uh, is poured out and then it says there's darkness and people gnaw their tongues with pain. So uh, light is cut off and people suffer with pain on the earth. And they, again, it says they blaspheme God. So none of these judgments are, you know, people are not repenting. They're just blaspheming God. They're getting angry with God. And it's almost likely because the people who have refused the mark of the beast, refused the image of the beast, are already killed, many of them. So it's really the others who have pledged allegiance to the beast who are suffering all these things. And the sixth angel pours uh, out the rod. This is Revelation 16, 12. And uh, it says here, the river Euphrates is dried up so that kings from the east might be prepared to come across. You know, now this is very interesting because, you know, in today's world, yeah, I mean, it just what's happening, what's playing out before us is how Russia from the East has made its move towards Ukraine. And, you know, at one point, nobody thought, hey, what's going, is this really going to happen? You know, are they really going to attack? And then, well, they did, right? And they, they moved East, attacking Ukraine. Now, in Revelation 16, 12, it's talking about the river Euphrates, just north of Israel, drawing up as a sign that the time has come when the kings of the east will begin to move towards Jerusalem, towards Israel, to attack. And what is going to motivate them? Revelation 16, 13, it says, unclean spirits will go out all over the world, they will come out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. In other words, you know, the beast, the antichrist and the false prophet are going to be speaking things that are actually going to cause unclean spirits to go and instigate leaders of the nations to gather them. <clears throat> uh, this is Revelation 16, 14, to gather them to come to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Right, so the, the beast and the false prophet, we read about them in Revelation 13. They're going to speak things. They're going to say words that will instigate the kings of the earth. That means the leaders of the earth, the whole world. And they're going to gather together for the great day of the battle uh, of, uh, of Armageddon. Right? And so we see that whole movement taking place, Revelation 16, 16, um, where it's mentioned uh, um, they're coming to the place called Armageddon or uh, Megiddo, which is to the northern part uh, of Israel. They're all gathering together. And then the seventh angel, the last bowl, uh, uh, is poured out and there's a loud voice saying it's done, meaning, okay, all the judgments of God are done. The third bowl is done. Uh, and there is great earthquake and lightning and so on on the earth. And even Jerusalem 
uh, is is divided into three parts. The whole city is shaken. Right? And basically he's saying, look, th this is a, the, 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 what's going to happen to Israel, is Jerusalem basically is tumultuous. So even the earth gives way, you know, the, there's a great earthquake and the city is divided uh, and, 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 and great, you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of things happening there. There's, there's hail, there's um, uh, men are blaspheming against God um, um, for the plagues and so on. So this is the last bowl saying, okay, it's all done. The earth is shaken. Jerusalem is divided into three parts. And it's like, okay, this is it. And the nations have started moving towards Jerusalem. And at that time, as the battle of Ar as the preparations are being made for the battle of Armageddon, at that time, two significant things happen. Revelation 17, this world religion collapses. Revelation 18, the world economic system collapses. All right, so you can see as the preparations are being made for the armies of the earth to gather against Jerusalem, these two things happen. It's almost like what we are seeing happen today, Russia, Ukraine, is just being played out in a global scale. Because there will be nations of obviously who are st standing by Israel and we could assume that uh, America, maybe Canada, maybe UK would stand by Israel. And we could assume that kings from the east, so a lot of the Arab nations, nations lying to the east of Israel would be against Israel. Now, if you and which we will study next year. If you look in detail as to how this will happen, I'll just give you give us an overview. You find this in Ezekiel chapter um, 38, 39. Um, the first move will be made by Russia. Right? Um, because um, it's, it talks about Ezekiel 38, it talks about the tribes of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, and, uh, you know, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal are tribes in the northern part, uh, in Russia. And they would say, you know, that land is at ease. We are going to go and disturb it. And so the first move will be made by Russia, will come and attack Israel. And it also tells us that uh, there will be allies to Russia. This is Ezekiel 38, verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya. Uh, Goma, which is Eastern Germany or part of Germany, uh, to Garma, which most people think refers to Turkey. So these are nations that will um, align themselves with Russia in its first move against Israel. But Ezekiel 38, 39 says, Israel will push Russia back. And then they will try to regroup and they're coming back with all the armies are moving now. There's all the kings of the east, the nations, the other moving. And obviously there are those allies of Russia uh, who are standing, uh, sorry, allies of Israel who are standing by Israel, which, you know, just given the political connections, the political scenario these days, we could say, you know, the US, the UK, uh, uh, Canada would stand by Israel. So then there's a bigger movement of armies towards Israel. And Revelation 16, 14, the nations of the earth, the whole world is being gathered together towards the Battle of Armageddon. So we will look at it in detail, but I'm just giving you an overview of how it's going to play out based on Ezekiel 38, 39, and Revelation 16. But while this is happening, Revelation 17 talks about Babylon, 
but it's referred to as mystery Babylon. So but anyway, the word mystery Babylon is used. It has to do with something religious, something spiritual. And the other reason why we say this is a, a world religious system is if you look at what this mystery Babylon was doing, uh, it was a great harlot. Harlot, again, is a term used for a, a religious system that's contrary to God. You know, so when Israel would depart from God, they would, you know, the Old Testament would say, Israel has played the harlot, departed from God. So this is a system that's taken people away from God. Uh, this is a system that, uh, verse 6 says, Revelation 17, 6, it has killed many saints and martyrs of Jesus. So that means it has, def this religious system is a system that has killed the people of God and people who believed in Jesus Christ. Right? And uh, uh, this system was supported by the 10 leaders who were supporting the Antichrist and the false prophet. So there are these 10 leaders uh, who were part of the former Roman Empire. So generally in, in and around Europe who supported the Antichrist and the false prophet. But these 10 leaders withdraw their support to this woman. Uh, that is this uh, this uh, uh, this false prophet and the beast, right? So, uh, uh, where is that? Yeah, this is in Revelation seventeen sixteen. It says, "The ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, and make her desolate." That means somehow there's going to be an internal conflict because these ten leaders supported the beast and the false prophet. The false prophet brought in this mystery Babylon, this world religious system. But remember, it was these 10 leaders who brought this antichrist, this man into power. But then, Revelation 17, 16, it says the 10 horns, that is the 10 leaders, will hate the harlot. That means they'll hate this religious system. They will turn against it. And so, uh, it says in Revelation 17, 17, God has put into their heart to fulfill his purpose. To be of one mind, to be, you know, or to give their kingdom to the beast until the words are fulfilled. So they supported, the, these 10 leaders, they supported the beast, that is the Antichrist, up until this point. But then they turn against the Antichrist. And so, uh, uh, so they, so this whole Babylonian mystery Babylon collapses. The world religious system collapses because the ten leaders withdraw their support. Okay. All right. So I see some questions there in the chat. Abhishek, will India go against Israel in the Battle of Armageddon? I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Or they'll just play neutral. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. But uh, if you go historically, uh, what we do know is India, Indian soldiers fought for Israel. Uh, I think it's World War II. They fought for Israel. Okay, so they actually supported Israel, um, and um, so that's what happened historically. But we don't know how things will be in the future. What position India will take? Another question, which book and which, which tells us this? So I was referring, referencing uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Um, so that's a question by C.C. Thomas. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Um, you can also look at Joel chapter 3, uh, you know, verse 2, verse 12 to 14. He's talking about the battle of Armageddon. And then, of course, Revelation 16, 16. Okay. We will look, at, look into these in detail next year. You know, we will study the actual verses, um, right? So, uh, what was I saying in Revelation 17? This mystery Babylon, this great harlot that sat sat upon the waters, that covered multitudes, nations, and tongues, that uh, killed the people who believed in Jesus. Suddenly, the ten leaders who supported the Antichrist and the beast withdraw support. So, this world religious system collapses. And it says, you know, that in Revelation 17, 17, God put in the hearts of these 10 leaders that they should support the Antichrist till this time. Once they withdraw the support, everything collapses. That means they are saying, 
we don't like this whole thing about getting people to worship the Antichrist. You know, that's not the reason why they brought him into power. They brought him into power because he came as a man of peace. But now he suddenly changed. He's taking up worship. We're withdrawing support. But then it's too late because the nations have already started marching against Israel. The second thing we see, right, just between, you know, as the build up towards battle of ba the Battle of Armageddon is happening, Revelation 18 is the economic system collapses. So, again, the word Babylon is used in Revelation 18, but here it's talking about Babylon the Great. Revelation is talking about Babylon, mystery Babylon. Now, Babylon is any man-made effort to replace God. So when the Tower of Babel was built, uh, that's where the name Babylon comes from. Uh, it was man's attempt to reach God. They're trying to build, we'll get, we'll get to, we'll get to God. Babel, Babylon. So mystery Babylon, a world religious system that was uh, pushed by the false prophet. Revelation 18, Babylon the Great, or the great city Babylon, talking about an economic system. And if you read the details, it becomes very clear because it talks about the merchants of the earth who became rich through uh, this whole system. And it says, uh, and uh, I'll just point out the, uh, these scriptures here. And it says, Revelation 18.10, the great city, the mighty city has fallen in one hour, in one hour, your judgment has come. Verse 11, Revelation 18.11, the merchants of the earth uh, mourn over half, or no one buys their merchandise anymore. So it's talking all about merchandise. And in Revelation 18 and verse 17, it says, In one hour, such great riches came to nothing. Revelation 18, verse 17. So that's why we know that Revelation 18 is talking about this economic system. And it says, In one hour. Right, and it, that's repeated uh, uh, again in Revelation 18, verse 19. You know, the people, the merchants who became rich by her wealth, in one hour she became desolate. Right, so uh, uh, this this whole economic system collapses, and you see here, it happens in one hour. And today, we can say that this is possible, that all the wealth and riches could just disappear in one hour, okay? In times past, and we're talking about something happening globally, right? Uh, it's talking about you know, merchants and people all over the earth who bought and sold, just everything just disappeared in an hour. So uh, in times past, uh, this was unimaginable. You know, how, how could it happen? living in today's world, we say, yeah, it's happened. It's happened many times before our eyes. But what Revelation 18 is talking about is something very huge, very catastrophic, that all the wealth just disappears. Okay, so these two big things happen as the buildup of the Battle of Armageddon is happening. Nations are getting ready for, for war. Revelation 19, uh, I'll just maybe go on for another five minutes and then uh, we'll take questions. In Revelation 19, what happens is, in heaven, there is the marriage supper of the Lamb. So now, up until this time, we've been seeing things happen here on earth. Um, in Revelation 19, look up into heaven, marriage supper of the Lamb. So um, Jesus is seated, and uh, the, 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 all these people, the servants of the Lord, who are worshiping God, and they have made themselves ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19 and verse 9, right? And right after the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19, 11, the heaven is opened, and Jesus is coming. He is coming for the great battle of Armageddon. So this is fulfilling Daniel chapter 2 where Daniel said, you know, uh, uh, um, in, in, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, it says, the God of heaven, a rock came out of heaven and struck and crushed the 
the, the image and that God set up his kingdom on the earth, right? So um, here, Revelation 19.11, Jesus comes for the armies of the earth, it's just they all the armies follow him. Revelation 19.15, out of his mouth goes a sword and he treads the winepress, the fierceness, the almighty God. So this was told to us, you know, by the angel, the fifth angel that announced and the wine press is ready to be crushed. And Revelation 19.15, he treads the wine press. So the Lord himself is the one who's going to carry out the judgment. Right? And there we see Revelation 19.17, you know, an angel saying, you know, go and gather everybody for the great supper of God. I mean, we, you know, I mean, the, the, there's going to be so much devastation. So many people are going to die in an instant. Right, and uh, it's, it's it says you know uh, Revelation nineteen nineteen the beast the kings of the earth they all got together to make war, uh, the beast was captured the false prophet again you see read about the false prophet here in Revelation nineteen twenty, and uh, and they were cast alive into the lake of fire, and the rest were killed the sword that proceeded from the mouth of God, from the mouth of the Lord, so this is. The battle of Armageddon, you know, the Lord comes, armies with him, the armies of the earth have gathered, they've come against Jerusalem, the Lord himself comes, and there's great destruction, lives are destroyed, and the beast and the false prophet are captured and thrown into the lake of fire, okay, so that's the battle of Armageddon, it's going to be a great devastation, like we saw in Revelation 16, blood will flow, as high as a horse's bridle for about 184 miles. Okay, I'm gonna take some questions here. I see Sissy's question. What is one hour in terms of biblical time? So one hour, we will interpret it as one hour, right? So when the Bible talks about 42 months, we say 42 months. When the Bible says 1,260 days, we say 1,260 days. So when the Bible says here in Revelation 18, one hour, we say one hour, which is 60 minutes. Um, we don't need to, we don't, we don't allegorize it. We don't use it figuratively. We take it literally. Okay. All right. So we've reached till the end of Revelation 19. Uh, did everybody make it safe through the tribulation? Okay, you've come through the Battle of Armageddon. Any questions? All right, I see the best question. Uh, the name Babylon uh, does it anything to do with the real systems that would be established by Satan? So would the name Babylon be literally used, maybe used as such? Um, there we can say, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't tell us that, and this is in Revelation 17 and 18, um, that uh, it is literal, right? It's talking about uh, uh, the the great harlot. So in Revelation 17, Revelation 18, when you look at it, uh, you can understand that it is making a reference to something as opposed to being um, a literal thing, right? So um, that's why we say that uh, it's figurative. It's talking about a great harlot. It's talking about the mystery of Babylon. So most likely, uh, um, um, the Antichrist will not be using, you know, literal the, the term Babylon literally, um, most likely. Right? It's used figuratively in 17 and 18. Nisha's question: Does rapture take place before all this? So, yes, Nisha, we we mentioned, uh, uh, you know, there in Revelation chapter when we were looking at this whole sequence, we mentioned that rapture takes place. And then we see Revelation chapters four and five. So the rapture has taken place before Revelation chapter four. 
Okay. All right. Is everything okay? Everything clear? Are you all with me? Any questions? Okay. Now, you know, there are passages we can cross-reference, which we are not doing right now. Um, like we mentioned, Ezekiel chapter 38, 39. Um, the book of Daniel, of course, which we will study next year. And there is also uh, Joel chapter 3. Also, Zechariah chapter 13 and 14. So all of these are cross-references towards uh, the build-up of the Battle of Armageddon, right? Uh, describing things that will happen. So uh, we will look at it next year, but uh, I just want you to be aware of it. Yes, Divya, your question. Yes, Pastor, thank you. Uh, in Revelation chapter 16, uh, with the sixth bowel, the Euphrates dried up. Uh, so I... I kind of remember you having told like it is, is it an example of a double um, a fulfillment? Yeah, a fulfillment that uh, the kings from the uh, East uh, also mentions about uh, China, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. Mm -hmm. So is it an example? Yeah, that? so yeah, so uh, the river Euphrates dries up. So we will take that literally. The, the Euphrates, river Euphrates dries up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. So um, in reference to the kings of the east, you know, we, uh, we, you know, the so China, China by name is not mentioned in the Bible or is not inferred. Uh, we cannot infer, but because it says kings of the east. Uh, we then look at all the nations east of Israel, which would include Arab nations, it would include Russia, and it would include China. Right? These are the two big nations uh, east of Israel. Who are so and 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 just just looking at the political situation, you know, you China and Russia are uh, dictatorships essentially. And so they are kind of aligned to each other, you know. And so if Russia moves in this way towards, we know Russia will move in because it's mentioned by name in Ezekiel 38. Uh, we know Arab nations are involved because they're mentioned by name in Ezekiel 38. It seems like Germany also, because of the, the, the tribe Gomer that's mentioned as equal that may also align itself with Russia in this battle. If you're, if you're going by the literal name there, Gomer. Um, and if Russia is moving in against Israel from the east, you know, it's logical to conclude that China would also engage in moving against Israel, because uh, Revelation 16, 14 says the kings of the earth and of the whole world gather to the great day. So China is not mentioned by name, but we are just drawing an inference because of the kings of the east. Uh, so Pastor, does, does it not refer to two different battles? Uh, if I'm like the battle of Ar Armageddon and the one that is going to take place post uh, millennial reign. Mm. Yeah, so um, the post-millennial reign, that battle, we we will just you know we'll come to it. That's in Revelation twenty and verse eight. So that'll be happening in Revelation twenty verse eight. And there again, Gog and Magog are mentioned. So that also is often used to refer to Russia. Okay. I mean, not just Russia, but people from that region. So uh, here in Revelation 16, it's just referring to the Battle of Armageddon. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank so Revelation 16 is uh, the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, just that when we get into the details, you see that it takes place in two stages. Um, uh, whereas the Battle of Gog and Magog is Revelation 28, chapter 20, verse eight 
which takes place at the end of the um, the millennium. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Good. Any other questions? All right, Christopher, how long would the battle of Armageddon be? From what we see in Revelation 19, right, do you see the description? I mean, I just ran over it. We didn't read every, uh, every verse. Uh, if you see uh, Revelation 19, it just uses the word. It just says that he will strike the armies with a word of his mouth. That means he's just going to speak words and it will uh, it, it will be done. And um, uh, let me give the exact reference. I think it is in uh, uh, Zechariah 14. It says that their flesh will just dry up on their bones. Uh, Zechariah um, chapter, yeah. So Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12. It says, the Lord will strike the people who fought against this Jerusalem. The flesh will dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will dissolve in their sockets. You know, so I'm, if you, if you say, how long will this happen? I think it's just going to be like almost an instant. It's going to be done. That means just by the word of his mouth. There's no, there's, you know, it's just going to happen in an instant. And um, it says that, that he will descend uh, on Jerusalem and uh, uh, on the Mount of Olives, you know, and he will, um, Zechariah 14, uh, verse 4, he will stand on the Mount of Olives and uh, it will split into two. So uh, uh, if you look at the whole description in detail, it's going to happen very, very fast. So... Well, the gathering together, you know, I mean, the, the, the build up together may take some time, may take some days. I don't know how long it'll take the build up for the battle of Armageddon, but the battle, of, the battle itself, and the Lord comes, Revelation 19 19, when, when the heavens are open, and the Lord comes um, and he makes war. It's going to be just his word spoken and it will be done. Okay, so the good news is there is chapters 20, 21, and 22, which we will look into next week. And that's all good news. All right, um, we're going to wrap up for the day. Thank you all for your uh, patient listening. Could somebody please um, pray with us and then we will dismiss. Anyone? Okay. All right, who wants to pray? And just uh, go ahead and pray. Okay, let's pray. Okay, Lord, we we thank you again as we come we come to to the end of this uh, this this class. We know we are living in the time in the end time, Lord, with the war going in Ukraine in Israel, and financial institution collapsing. And the only solution can come from you, Lord. And we, as your children and as your people, Lord, we only look to you, Lord. And we pray Jesus, that you. Strengthen our faith, Lord. You'll strengthen believers' hearts. Those who are through war, those who are through economic problems. Let them know that you, even though it's a time, time traveling time we are living in, Lord, you you are always with us, Lord, and you you'll walk with us and you see us through it all, Lord. We pray for that you you be with us, and yeah, we pray that that you take all the glory. And let your name be praised, Jesus. In your mighty name, Father, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your patient listening. 
Um, God bless you. I'll see you. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kennedy. Thank you, Say. Thank you, everybody. God bless. God bless. Thank you. Crazy, Abraham, Anita, Georgia, Kennedy, Louis, Rose, Lomi, Sibijit. God bless you all. See you tomorrow. Bye now.